Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. Billy Porter and Stark Sands, the original stars of Kinky Boots, have returned to the Tony Award winning Best Musical for a limited time, and I caught up with them here at the legendary Sardis. Welcome back to Broadway and to Kinky Boots. Thank, Thank you. you. How does it feel? It's been, uh, I mean, for me, it's just been thrilling. It's been healing. It's been very powerful in terms of being able to go to work and, you know, tell a story that puts the message of love and acceptance and, you know, out into the world. It's really great to be able to be active in that way. So it's healing for me. Yeah. It's very healing. It's also, uh, it, it's meaningful. I think that uh, um, out of all the jobs that I've been lucky to have, this none of them have a more powerful message than this show. And you get the benefit of feeling it in the room while you're doing it, yeah. as opposed to working in television and film, where it's like you might feel the after effects later on, but like, man, we're delivering a message and it's landing. Yeah. And it's, this is unprecedented. We had this conversation when we first started that two stars return to an original run. It is? Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, like Debbie Reynolds went back into Irene, people have gone back, but one star, not two together. Oh wow. So how did this happen for you two? Well, we had talked about it. Ever since I left, yeah. we'd always said, like, we'll, we'll do it again. But maybe it'll be in the West End. You know, maybe it'll be five years down the road or whatever. And then the events of the most recent presidential election happened and the campaign was ugly and there was a lot of anger and um, hate sort of floating around and it didn't feel good. After the election results, Billy and I had a conversation and, and uh, decided that we wanted to make it more of a priority. I ran into the producers at an event and pitched the idea and they responded. Now we're here. What was that first performance like back on stage again at the theater? What do you remember about that day? I don't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just showed up and had my makeup done and said, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> we had three days of rehearsal. And then a wow. Party. And none of that is, it can replicate the experience of doing it in front of a full house. So um, we were as ready as we could be. Yeah. And it was all in there. You know, the, the three days were, turned out to be enough. Yeah. But um, it really was like being shot out of a cannon. And, 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 you know, there's no stopping it once it starts. It was like we never left, too. That's the thing. It, it's, it feels... It feels as we continue to do it too, it feels like it, we never, we never left. I would say like, after three performances, so after the Tuesday and then the two Wednesday shows, the very next one, I didn't need to like reference my my script anymore. I didn't need to check notes or like around, what's my name? And then I do this, then I did, it was just like, I closed it and I put it underneath my dressing station and I just did the show. And it really was like that. Yeah. It's like, it's like we never left. Yeah. Well, this show has to be in your muscle memory because you guys created this show. It was created for you and on you. Yeah. Yeah, and I did it over a thousand times. And I was I was very nervous about it. And, you know, I did some pre-production and then we got on stage for rehearsal and it literally was like riding a bike or, yeah. you know. It really was, shockingly and surprisingly. Has this run enriched your performances? Do you view your characters, the roles you play, a little differently than the first time around? Have they been enriched? Yes, they've been enriched. I'm, um, things have changed for me personally, yeah. not just the sort of the state of the country, but you know, my wife and I had a child, so I'm a father now. And so that has, you know, that, that's an added <coughs> new layer to the, to the performance. I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older and wiser, and I'm great, so grateful to be able to come back and do it because not everybody can do that. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot more to it. Yeah, it's different. You know, the world is different. I'm also different. I got married in the interim, and you know, that's a different kind of energy that that you know informs. Um, you know, Lola is different this time around. You know, my grandmother used to always talk about. Hell yes, one is supposed to love everyone and we yeah. want to love everyone and that's the way to move forward. But <clears throat> there are different kinds of love and sometimes it's time for tough love to be employed. And right now it's about tough love. Yeah. You know, it's not about walk over me love. It's about tough love. And so I can love you and still tell you you're wrong and still 
you know, and st because to love you is to inform you of that infraction, to inform you of your wrongness. Mm -hmm. um, and so Lola has taken that on more. Um, yeah, she's taken it on. It wasn't really coming from that perspective before, yeah. but now it is. Um, so it's very different for me. Yeah. yeah. You know, you talk about being a dad. Your whole life shifts, doesn't it? Priorities and everything else. Yeah. Jobs, opportunities, um, I'm much more selective now than I was because it's got to be something really important to take me away from my son and my wife and my life. And this is one of those that's definitely worth it. Yeah. And married life has to change everything for you, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a black gay man who came out in the 80s. Yeah. You know, there was no, there's no reference point. There's no context for it. There was no dreaming about weddings. There was no dreaming about marriages. There wasn't, it wasn't even in the conversation. So I'm still wrapping my head around the idea that I'm allowed to legally. You know, like yeah. that, it really does change your perspective because your relationships take on a different um, importance and a different resonance because you can't just walk away anymore. Mm. <laughs> you know, when you actually tie the knot, you're actually really legally doing so, yeah. which I think, you know, it's just different. You know, when we stood in front of our family and friends and said our vows to each other, that community, you know, the community that is present to support your love and thereby, you know, till death to us part for good or for bad, whatever that is, all of those things that we sort of learned or know or cling to or whatever, you know, there's a support system in place now that we never had before. You know, there are so many powerful messages in this show, and you two have this incredible synergy of working together. I mean, what's it like sharing the stage together again? It's as magical as it was the first time, and it was part of the deal. Both yeah. of us, neither, neither of us wanted to come back without the other person, and I only ever did it with Billy, and so that was my, me being selfish. Yeah. But um, I'm glad they allowed it. And yeah. Glad that we got to do it. You know, we, we just... You know, when you find a partner, you find a partner. And it just works no matter what yeah. he throws out, no matter what I throw out. It's just there. You don't have to think about it. It's like my brother from another mother. It's, and you don't have to, you know, it yeah. just... Well, it's funny because one answer to that would be, well, Billy and I did the reading together, and we did the out-of-town run together, and then we did all that first year on Broadway together. But the truth is, this it's always been there, even from the first rehearsals. Yeah. So it's yeah. not, it doesn't actually mean that it you know that it took all of that to to create yeah. it. It was there. Yeah. yeah. One of the most beautiful moments in the show, of course, is I'm not my father's son. What was it like that first night? Do you remember singing that together? I remember when we rehearsed it, which we did one time. That um, it was incredibly moving. And Bill, you should talk about this mm -hmm. more than me. But just to, I, I spend that song really listening until the very end, and it it, it always is a moving. Uh, experience, but that first rehearsal, sitting there and doing it in an empty theater with just the associate director and the, and you know, it was uh, it was pretty powerful. Yeah, it you know, it was the first song that I ever heard from the show. It's the first song that I learned. It's the first song that I heard, and you know, my biological father and my stepfather. I had my relationships with them were strained at best. Um, and, you know, to have someone write a lyric that was, that felt like it was coming from out of my gut, yeah. from out of my bosom, you know, just took my breath away. And, you know, the trajectory that Lola takes in this story that is about, I mean, there are many, but it's about that healing, the discovery of the violation, the understanding of that separation between she and her father, and then the coming back together of forgiveness yeah. is something that I had to go through. And I think the universe 
created a space where I could go through that healing. Is there going to be a music video? What's happening with this song? What can you tell us? There's a music video, yes. There's a music video. <laughs> you all obviously know. <laughs> Did you see it? There's a, there's a, there's a acoustic version mm -hmm. that Cindy Lauper put together. It's a wow. duet version. Um, and there will be a music video in connection with it. And I don't it's know not, when it's coming out. It's yeah. not um, Lola and Charlie. Yeah. It is it, it, Billy and Stark. Oh. It's, you know, it's, 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 two, it's two individuals. Yeah. It's not really tied to the show. There's moments, you know, that yeah. Yeah. reference the show. But it's, I think it's a really good opportunity to reach out virally and oh, connect yeah. with people that, in a way that doesn't have to be through the show. <laughs> favorite fan moment at Kinky Boots? Uh, you know, my favorite are the ones who come and reveal to me that this show allowed for them, helped them love themselves mm. enough to make necessary changes in their life, depending, you know, depending upon what it is. Those are my favorite moments. There was a, there's a young gentleman who, you know, lost a lot of weight, yeah. you know, from the first time that I, I saw him, you know, I would say over a hundred pounds, you know, and to, you know, there, there was something inside of learning how to love yourself, mm -hmm. learning how to love yourself enough to respect yourself enough to yeah. take care of yourself. Um, those are always my favorite. Yeah, I think that in contrast to that, th those are amazing when you have someone who looks you in the eye and says, this show saved my life. Yeah. This show changed my life. Thank you. Um, there are also the ones where they may not be super fans, but they were like brought to the show by their partner, right? Maybe they're, they're, they're people, a guy who might not choose this show, but it wasn't their time to choose. And I see them outside the show in a line, and, and we're signing autographs, and these, these sort of, you know, these guys who might not, you might not think would like the show, say to me, you know, I didn't really think I was gonna like this, but you guys really made me think. That's awesome. That's like, if we do that every night, yeah. man, we're winning. Well, it's great to watch everybody on their feet at the end of the show. Everybody gets <laughs> up, right? Yes. You know, looking back, cr uh, craziest things that have gone wrong for you on stage during a performance at Kinky Boots? Because there's so much stuff that happens in this show. I got my favorite one. Okay. I, uh, I was on stage at the top of the show right before Lola comes running out of the alley. There's the broken beer bottle yeah. and the gate and then the two thugs that are chasing Lola. <laughs> And I'm on stage. Does this involve me? Yes. <laughs> it involves me too. So I am on stage. We just finished taking yeah. what we got. And I'm walking through. I hand the, the box of, uh, of shoes to the homeless man. And then the next thing that happens is you're supposed to hear Lola going, hoo, hoo, and then the guy's chasing her. And I step in and stop it. Yeah. So the sound effect happens. But instead of hearing Lola. They turn my mic on. I hear warm up. And I'm in my dressing room singing gospel music. <laughs> At the top of my lungs, and and but there's also the weird, eerie, like <laughs> music, and, and you hear Jesus, yes, Jesus, <laughs> and so I'm just sort of like, okay, and I know what's happening. My brain, you, you, you step outside of yourself in this moment. You know what I'm talking about? You just go, you look, how do I feel this moment? So I'm on stage. Then I hear Billy, somebody run into his room and go, Billy, 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 you're cute. And then he goes, Oh no, oh, and then I hear, and then I think they cut his mic. <laughs> So he, could get, so he could finish getting out of his running on stage. But it's like 30 seconds yeah. of dead space. Horrified. It, all I could do. Horrified. All I could do was stand there and just sort of look around. And so, and there's an echo on my voice at the moment, just because it's supposed to be in an alley. And I just go, hello? <laughs> And eventually Billy ran on, and it was a little bit flustered. Oh for, my for the first, god, like, 10 it minutes, was horrible. But it was awesome. horrible. I loved it. Um, my favorite was. <laughs> oh, there's a, one bigger than that. Well, the, well my <laughs> favorite was. That was his. You forgot when you went up for like a, a five minutes. Well, there's two. There's <laughs> two. So yeah. there's one when I come in for the sexes in the heel yeah. scene, and my heel breaks on the step. <laughs> Amazing. So I'm singing. The sex is in the heel, even if you break it, limping, because I have I have taken the shoe off. Yeah. 
I'm waiting for people to like, you know, because everybody knows. And I'm like, somebody find another shoe, please. You know, I'll get it. You know, everybody's like waiting around, waiting to interject to the best part. I'm like, there's no best part. Just hand me the shoe. <laughs> hand me the shoe. Somebody give me the shoe. They toss me the shoe. I'm singing. I get it in in the sec- in the second verse. We're downstage, right? And I'm singing to him. And I'm like, the sex is in the heel. Second verse, whatever that is. Tell it, jack it up. And, I'm, and by the time we you know, pull out of that. It, the shoe is on. It's a half size too small. And I finish awesome. the number. That was fabulous. <laughs> then there's another time with Andy after he left. Yeah. You know, I come I, I into the dressing room right after um, Land of Lola. Yeah. So it's the first scene. And the line is, ah, <laughs> uh, he lives. Yeah. Hello, my name is Lola. Uh, they call me Lola because it's my name. Yeah. So I come around and I was like, hi, I'm Lola. That's not right. He says nothing. I have nothing. And when I say nothing, nothing. Not a line. I'm looking at him. I'm looking at the set. I'm like, the only thing I can remember that I'm supposed to do right now is take this Herve Legere dress off and put on that spider outfit. Change my shoes and change my... I literally was like, oh my gosh, you're gorgeous. I must have called him gorgeous about 50 times. He didn't do anything. Andy. He didn't do anything. He froze. Andy he Kelso, froze. he completely froze. He went to the white room. Yeah. I'm <laughs> flitting. I mean, it must have been... It felt like 27 minutes. And finally, you know, I was trying to figure out what to say. Yeah. And finally, I was like, let, let me just get these clothes on. <laughs> And leave. If that were to ever happen yeah. again, yeah. I would just stop. Yeah. I would just stop and be like, look, y'all, I, I just messed up royally. We're going to roll back for a second, okay? <laughs> We're going to roll back for a second and get this right because y'all done paid way too much money for this ticket. Y'all need to get this. Y'all need to get this. I mean, yeah, I mean it was that lady. bad. She it was it. It was yeah. that <laughs> bad. <laughs> Who has the go-to dressing room? The go-to the dressing room? Out of you two. Probably Billy. Uh, He's I don't know TV. what you mean by go to. Like people come come Hang to visit. Out or... I, <laughs> you, Billy has more guests than I do. I have more guests. I would love for it to be a hangout room, yeah. but it's not really that kind of show. Yeah. Because I have to like, you know. I mean, I guess I would because I have more friends. I have I have guests, not more friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's, not what I mean. That's not what I mean. But you know, like he said, I, you know. Uh, well, I the other know. thing is that I don't live in the city anymore. Yeah. So I try, my guests, I come in, I spend a certain amount of time, but then I got to go home. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, and I've, I've just become, you know, the doorman is waiting on me to leave. Because <laughs> I got to eat afterwards yeah. now. You know, I just turned 48. My dry bones, child, I got to get my medication in, <laughs> you know, diabetes. I got to eat before I get home, you know. To eat in the dressing room? Well, I try to eat now at, right, directly yeah. after the show because that starts the clock of digestion. God, so God. I don't have to stay up until 2 in the morning to digest. Because if, if I lay down too early, then I have acid reflux. These are all <laughs> the things that you have to look forward to, children. <laughs> Doing eight shows a week. Doing eight shows a week. How easy was it for each of you stepping back into the kinky boots? Billy never stepped out of the kinky boots. Yeah, I was on tour this summer with my album, and I was doing 45 minutes to an hour in the boots every concert, so I never left. I it was I think it was trickier for me, but mainly because they built me new ones. Yeah. And even though they had my old ones, which I tried on in a fitting yeah. a few weeks before we started, I was so happy. I was like, oh, great. I don't have to break in any new boots. And then they bought me new boots. Or they made me new boots. So they still fit, but they're just, it's just, there's a breaking period. When, by now, they're in. They're so, in? Yeah. Let's talk about latest projects. Tell me about your new album. Uh, my new album is called Billy Porter Presents the Soul of Richard Rogers. Um, I love the title. We have taken. How did you come up with the title? Well, because it's Richard Rogers and presented by you. And that's why I'm presenting it. <laughs> no, um, you know, it's a. It, I, what I wanted to do was, um, you know, it has a bunch of guests yeah. on it, a bunch of guest stars. Uh, uh, the group that I call the sort of new contemporary Broadway yeah. artist, that, a bunch of Hamiltonians. Like Leslie Odom Jr. and Renee yeah. Goldsberry and Chris Jackson, and then there's Cynthia Erivo, there's Patina Miller. Um, all the, your old students, basically. <laughs> a yeah. lot of my old students. 
Um, and then we moved into the R&B soul world with Lettucey and Deborah Cox and India Ari. Uh, Pentatonics is there. Wow. Tadra Hall um, is one of the YouTube sensations who also played Lolo on Broadway. And what I wanted to do was, you know, I think um, Hamilton has been able to crack open a conversation about a different kind of music yeah. uh, on Broadway. Um, you know, the argument has always been, and I have lived it for the last 25 to 30 years of my career, that <coughs> the type of music that is authentic to me and my culture doesn't tell stories. That's not true. It may not be the stories you want to hear, but we've always told stories. And so, you know, this is an album about wrangling that group of people together, harnessing that energy, and showing, yes, and it needs to continue. Yeah. This, these voices need to continue. We, it's authentic. Um, they are storytelling prop, uh, energies and voices, and uh, that's why I wanted to put the album together. I'm trying to be the Quincy Jones of Broadway. Um, <laughs> You are. Because it's not just about me. Yep. It's not just about me. It's about me and yeah. everybody else who has aligned to create the space where these new contemporary voices can exist. Because it has, they have to. Um, and so that's where the, where the album came from. It's terrific. Thank you. Really terrific. You have a new movie coming out. I do. It's called The Post. Um, I was very lucky to, uh, they, they reached out, um, Steven Spielberg is directing it, Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks are starring. It's about uh, the Pentagon Papers in 1971, yeah. and specifically what happens at the Washington Post. And so, in addition to those names, there's qu quite a supporting cast as well, with Bob Odenkirk and David Cross, and Carrie Coon and Tracy Letts, and Michael Stuhlbarg and Jesse Plemons, wow. and, you know, Alison Brie, and yeah. it's just, an, it, it was a really amazing way to spend my summer. You know, so many cool things happened when you were in the original run of Kinky Boots, and you guys got something. I love these. <laughs> I think these are really cool. What was it like that day? Because you all got these together, right? Jerry Mitchell got his. Yes. Natalie Ashford, you guys got yours, right? I mean, yes. what Sardis? I know. It's amazing. It's mind blowing. You know, I, I don't know. I was really happy. It was. I'm uh, still just trying to take it in. You know, be present yeah. for everything. It's such a gift. It's such a blessing, you know, to be able to achieve your dreams. And, you know, I just want to continue to do that and pay it forward. And this is, yeah. this is a reminder. They are really cool really things cool to reminder. come in here. Yep. Has being a part of Kinky Boots made you live your life in a different way since you did this show? The way you view life? And people. I would like to think that it reinforced the way that I was already living yeah. my life, but that's also a really good thing, you know. I'm, uh, it, it's enriched my life, and it's it, it gives me hope. It continues to give me hope, especially in, in dark times. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I feel like it's just uh, sort of boosted it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up in a time where, you know, I always say it's easy to be who you are when what you are is what's popular. You know, everybody talks about, you know, oh, just be honest, oh, just be truthful, oh, just be yourself. And it's like, mm, yeah, it's real easy to do that when what you are is not reviled. You know, and so the choice that I made as a black gay man in the 80s, when everybody, Christian man in the yeah. 80s, when everybody from every part of my life was telling me who I was and what I was was wrong, there was no validity to it, and it would never work in any way, in any way. It would never work. You know, the validation of showing up and this show at the end of that long, long journey being the catalyst for everything. You know, it's now on my terms. Everybody was proven wrong. You know, and it was because I took the road less traveled. It was because somewhere inside of me, I knew that they were all wrong. Yeah. You're wrong. I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'll live long enough to, to prove that to you, you know, but the only way that I can live is inside of my truth. And if that makes you uncomfortable, too bad. You guys are so terrific. It is great to have you back on Broadway again in this incredible show. And thanks so much for sitting with me today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Let me raise you up. Bring your bubble.